Dr. Mirivaz, you are required in a medical science wing. I almost considered putting on a pair of earmuffs then and there, and staying in my bunk. Spent nearly half a decker cycle on my home world's most prestigious college, learning all I could about xenobiology, multi-race medicine, and both domestic and alien archaeology. To say then that I was displeased with my job as a doctor aboard a bog standard freighter called the Minty would be an understatement. Maybe I was naive in thinking I would be among those few to make some groundbreaking discovery in at least one of those fields, but those people still had to take some steps to get there, right? At this point, I was about done with being a menial worker for a ship crewed by people I would describe as filthy. Honestly, you would think by the 7th or 8th time you treat someone for an interspecies illness, that the crew would learn something, but not so for the Minty's humble spaces. Either way, I knew I was stalling by the time they called me for a second time over the intercom. So I stretched all four of my arms, get dressed, put on my glasses, and literally strolled down to my place of work. I placed my bets on one of the guys having picked up something venereal from our last planetary stop, probably some interspecies intolerances too. To say I was dead wrong would be the biggest understatement of my career. With some of the security crew standing watch over it, there sat an artifact of human origin. Humanity was an ancient species, the first ever known intergalactic civilization, and the only death order ranked civilization to achieve FTL travel of their own accord. Notoriously, some artifacts of theirs, if improperly handled, could split planets in two. Given my educational backing, I happened to be among the few who could read and speak their language. One of the most cherished items they left behind being some educational videos for children on how the English language worked. Some may chuckle at that, but in Xenoarchaeology, that kind of material is like finding a solid gold planet. Either way, I stood stunned and in awe of this cryosleeper. A general storage device used to keep anything from food to real people in stasis for days if not years. So far, no one had found a live wise man in a cryosleeper though. The seals in the past not being the best seal for the millennia they lay dormant. Where on Rift did you guys find this thing? Just floating around? The storage info plate on the front of the pod read, Patrick, Cervantes, a name. So, I knew this thing had a person inside of it. Alive or dead was the question, and I see with anticipation. Well, yeah, pretty much. Caught some spare salvage off the radar and caught this wedged into an asteroid. Didn't know what it was till we brought it in. Would have called you in sooner if we figured that out in space. Tim Moon was among the kinder souls aboard. Here's the only real death order aboard, being a big buff and thick-skinned Tifaki. He'd been the single person keeping me from just plain spacing myself at times, which with him being chief of security made it all the better on me. Shoot, make some tell me it was a piece of human tech. You know I don't stall for that. Yeah, but thought not to get you excited. Whenever they open these things, the man inside is always dead as bones. Chief Engineer Krieger was among the people who ended up in a sick bay a lot of the time, thanks to her activities on leave as I would know all too well. Being a Keltru and she looked and was built like a supermodel. Her species was only a notch off death order status for lacking a few key traits. While I take no issue with Krigger personally, I did wish that most of the crew would not follow in her example on leave. Only because the sills always cracked, this one looks pristine. Where's the captain? I think he'd be here for this. High pirate activity reported in our star lane. Giri is adamant on staying at the bridge and I'm not one to rip it from him. We've dealt with pirates before, small groups, but repair costs always added up after those attacks. Couldn't blame our captain there. Oh, uh, okay, fair enough. Somebody get me glass and a wrench? I've gotten rusty with how you're supposed to go about opening a cryopod, but I can easily recall the basics and what handles and levers you need to grease and pry at. I nearly busted the defroster starter, which made me cringe, but the seal on the sleeper itself was still intact, so I was hopeful. The sleeper's auxiliary power fired up, started the defrosting process, the moment of truth within just a few minutes away. The next few minutes were also going to get a lot longer. Red alert, bogus off starboard, all hands to battle stations. The captain, for all he is, was no slouch in getting the situation across well through tone alone. Tamon, Krieger, and most of the other crew present bolted off to the bridge, armory and engine room respectfully. This left me pretty much solo in medical, should any wounded be funneled in. Up to this point, the small couple of pirates we faced had been some drops in the bucket, the Minty having been more armed than most freighters our size. However, looking out the porthole, I could plain see that this group was in a small frigate, with border craft coming in hot. I would have started writing my will, 
if only I knew no one from home was ever going to lay eyes on it. As a non-combative member of the Minty, I did the noble thing, and hid behind the cryosleeper. I may be well educated, but I cannot work a firearm for the life of me. With the crash of a boarding craft into an airlock on the other side of the hall from medical, I figured this was going to be it. The heavy boots of pirates and armored exoskeletons all but tore the door off. Free to flackly like Muon walk in. At this point I envied the guy in the cryosleeper who wouldn't be waking up for this, until this assault was over. Well on the bright side, at least I got to actually lay hands on a piece of human tech. I knew they found me when I heard the charge of a plasma shotgun close to my head, and a metallic chuckle of a Teflaki pirate in grade A power armor. Flax are either sweet and kind like Muon, or bloodlusting warriors who think that being part of the Galactic Coalition makes them weaker than weak. A lot of those same people also carried off the better chunk of the galaxy's plasma weaponry, and have been a pirate scourge against space for since before I was born. Needless to say, I thought I was dead. Keyword being thought. I could feel the plasma heat build up along the side of my face, and just as it was about to hit climax, it went cold. I heard the sounds of crumpling metal and bone, and I could feel droppers of leafy green viscous blood trickle onto my lab coat. What I saw then crash down in front of me was a teflaki, helmet crushed like a used ration bar wrapper while still in his head. Before I even look up, the other two were already lukewarm on the floor, charred stumps where the head should be. With a hand on the cryo sleeper, I had realised it was open and empty, whatever its contents were now missing. I was pondering what to be more worried about when I heard something behind me clear his throat. Uh, um, do you speak English? Taller than me by a full third of my own height, I went up like a side up death welder, shoulders broader than the most flax, a voice smoother than a Keltrian's, and awfully polite given the circumstance. A more primitive species would have labelled him a god and worshipped him as such. Honestly, I wouldn't have blamed them. Thankfully, I was among the few dozen people in the galaxy that did speak humanity's English. Kah! Uh, yes, yes I can. You... you... you're a tall guy. I was also, however, under a bit of stage fright. This was the first human anyone had ever seen alive, and it was up to me to do first contact. I felt small. Suppose so. Good to know there's still some intelligible words out there. Got a name? He didn't seem bothered with the corpses on the floor. Combined with the smoking sidearm up his hip, I had to assume he was a veteran soldier. Wasn't killing me, though. So he wasn't just some mindless killer. Y yeah. Dr. Miravas Velonoria. Head of medical staff aboard the Minty. We're and currently being boarded by pirates. I couldn't see his face, but I could tell his eyes were narrowing. Patrick Cervantes. Oh, since I'm willing to bet that Soul Command no longer exists, you may call me Pat. Dr. Miravas. I am to assume that these pirates of yours will wear the same outfit? I'm pretty sure. Till flaky suits are known for uniformity. Don't know how many there are though, and probably moving fast. We should get going. If any majority of the crew were left by now, they were either dead or dying. Death Worlders have a habit of eating us less combat inclined like cereal foods. I knew Muon would be still fighting whatever force remained. Thankfully, I also knew he would be dressed in the Minty's uniform rather than any of his culture's armour. Alright then, Miri. I don't waste any time then. Follow if you want. Don't get shot. Normally, what Pat would be doing would, under any other circumstances, be suicidal, but he's human. As I was quick learning, if humans were still around in force, they would single-handedly be the policing force of the Coalition. Following behind, all I got barraged with were some far-reaching splatters of blood. His sidearm shot ballistics rounds, which ignited into something like a breaching charge and impact, leaving any remains charred. Pat's hand was an industrial-grade trash compactor, cracking through armored exoskeleton mounted armor like a welding torch through tinfoil. All the while, any plasma burst that hit him just singed off the paint. Most of the crew we passed by were either dead, dying, or hidden well enough that we wouldn't find them right away. Pat's first major stop was the engine room, where the flags were placing demolition charges. They never had the time to finish arming them, as Pat made the room go silent with four quick, well-placed shots. Didn't see any sign of Krieger, so there was hope our chief engineer hadn't bidden it. The bridge was a bit of a different story. When we got there, no one save Muon was alive. The pirate captain, if I had to guess, was busy giving a speech to Muon about the weakness of the coalition, his men toying with the limp body of our captain. I had never really cared to get to know the captain personally, but it was still sickening to see him lay bare like so. I almost threw up. Pat, meanwhile, shot the last five Tefaki dead, leaving a wounded Muon to gaze up in a mix of horror and confusion. Hey, Muon. You still have one of those two hearts in there? He looks at me, standing behind Pat like a petite little kid. 
I'll walk most of it off. But where in the 14 layers did you find that guy? Pat didn't have a clue what Galactic Common was, and an automatic translator was, as of now, something still only possible in fantasy media, so he just shrugged and looked at me. He was in the cryosleeper. His name's Pat. Pat was stared throughout the room, littered with bodies. One of his comparatively gargantuan hands lands upon my shoulder. It came as a shock to me at first, but the relief at the understanding that Pat knew all too well what had happened here. In some way, that gave me enough comfort to carry on. So so you're saying he's a human, alive, in the flesh. Last man standing too, by the looks. Tim Moon stood up. Pat still stood taller by at least a quarter of a standardized meter. May the saints grant mercy on us all. <laughs>